Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Series 6 of the Plant-Based Podcast is brought to you with the help of Vivara UK. Vivara are a team of garden wildlife experts and their mission is to make nature accessible to everyone. They provide ideas and solutions to create more wildlife habitats, from large green spaces to small urban areas. Join them at vivara.co.uk today. Okay, so we're here today in Cambridgeshire and we're at ProVeg Seeds and we're here with the manager, Andrew Bennett, and we are going to talk about vegetables. We're going to talk about all the new vegetables that are coming up, not just for 2022, but also 2023 and beyond as well. But this is going to be a slightly special episode because we're actually going to walk and talk. So you're actually going to come on the trials with Andrew, Ellen and I, and it's going to be really fun. We're going to do some taste testing along the way. I'm looking out for that kind of turnip that tastes like a melon that I know I really love. The milky sweet corn that we've had here before. What else are we going to see? Maybe some black tomatoes. I saw those they over in the amazing. corner. Definitely. So yeah, welcome to the podcast, Andrew. You're very welcome. It's good to see you here. Thank and you. Um, yes, we'll see lots of different, um, lots of different crops. Um, we have over 300 varieties here, so mm-hmm. there's plenty to see. So let's just tell listeners where we're standing right now, because I know lots of our plant-based growers would do anything to be standing in this polytunnel <laughs> that we're in right now. So what have you got going on in this polytunnel? We've got um, over 40 varieties of new varieties of tomatoes. Um, so we've, we've replicated the trial inside a polytunnel, and outside on the outside area so you'll see the same varieties Mm -hmm. Um, and we're looking to see how they perform in in different conditions Um, and we're obviously we've got some varieties that are already in the market we've introduced over the last few years and then we've got some brand new varieties to us Mm Okay, and before we kind of before we start talking around, tell us a little bit about ProVeg because you don't sell to the public, but you do sell to a lot of the seedsmen that then do sell to the public. So your visitors here wouldn't be the general public; it is actually buyers, retailers, etc. So give us a little kind of potted history of ProVeg, and and you are breeding as well. So tell us a tiny bit about that too. Yeah, we are breeding um, certain varieties and certain groups of, of vegetables. Um, ProVeg is thirty three years old. Um, very much started as a as a small family business and it's developed from that point um, and it's got quite a widespread market uh, throughout the UK but also throughout the rest of the world um, selling to home garden packet seed companies around the world but also to some commercial growers so, and um, yeah, it, it has probably one of the widest portfolio of vegetables um, it's very much a business based on looking for its uniqueness, unique vegetables um, that have some sort of difference to the main mainstream. That's very cool. Because yeah, actually definitely. there's a lot more growers who do want a different variety, who want to try something new and exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we were saying earlier on, lots of people, including myself sometimes, we grow the same stuff because we've grown it year on year and we know it's reliable, it's you we, yeah, you yeah. enjoy it, it's, you know, someone new to gardening might see certain varieties in books that have been on the shelves for for years, you know, but actually now because of Instagram, for example, social media, you can see like a new wave of growers just really excited mm. about growing mm. new Um, varieties you know just trying out new stuff which is really cool actually isn't it so you're there with that and the newness is not only coming through the home garden market it's now becoming through 
Um, some of the, the supermarkets are looking mm. for, for for different mm. and newness. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that really ProVeg has has, um, has developed its its place in the market okay. um, and continues to develop yeah. varieties from around the world. Do you think people? Sorry, do you think people are getting bored of buying like the same old tomatoes every day from the supermarket? Well, I said this to you earlier, Alan, but I used to feel when I was working at Thompson Morgan, it was kind of frustrating sometimes. Customers were always growing and buying Boltardi, for example, in the beetroot class. But I'm not really part of that allotment circle on Instagram, so you're probably better placed to answer that question. Um, I just think if you are someone who's not growing, first of all, and you're going to the supermarket and you're mm. buying the same tomatoes week on week, does that get boring? Probably, yeah. So, mm. But actually for the supermarkets to start thinking about selling some new cool stuff to keep people interested in vegetables and stuff, yeah, mm. I think that's probably mm. happening now. But I do think a lot of it is being driven by um, kind of like a lot of press about healthy eating or plants in your diet, but also social media. So people who, mm. you know, the home growers mm. that are getting excited about trying new things and not always wanting to post the same photograph of the same tomato year on yeah, year. Yeah. They want to try something different. Do you know what I mean? And I mm. think that whole kind of, that whole circle is making people mm. want to just try out new mm. stuff. I think so, yeah. Instagram's got a lot to, to an answer, answer for. A lot to answer for, <laughs> yeah. It really has though, because it has really transformed what people want to grow and why. Yeah. I just want to ask you another question before we start having to walk around. So the varieties that you're selecting and trialling here, they would be for the home gardener or commercial or both? For both. Because there's for both. obviously different needs, aren't for, there? There are, di there are differences mm. and um, commercial growers want evenness. Um, because when we say commercial, we mean veg on shelves. Correct, right? yeah. correct. Um, so they want um, very uniform crops, um, where I think the home gardener wants something that's going to last, um, be able to pick vegetables over a much extended period. Mm. Um, so both, both certain varieties cover both markets, but um, in most cases, it's a very different variety for mm. the home garden yeah. um, compared to a commercial grower. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, cool. So shall we start to take a little walk yeah, around definitely. and have a look at what we've got going mm. on here? So in the polytunnel, you just said, did you say 40, sorry? There's over 40 varieties. Over 40 wow. varieties here. So um, when we're talking about great big beef steaks and I can see some amazing black tomatoes down the end of the yeah, polytunnel there. Wow. They look super cool. Can you tell us about maybe some of the favourites so far? Yes, there's, there's, a, there's a range through some of the beef steak, some of the, the sort of um, large cooking Roma types. These, uh, these are amazing. Look at the size of that. It's a uh, big Roma. Which, which obviously tomato. have still got to ripen, but... Yeah. Um, it's particularly a little bit backward this year in, in this year's conditions, but... Yeah. Uh, so have you, you had some, I'm sorry, have you had some blight issues or are you growing mostly... We're just beginning to see blight come outside. Because that's uh, obviously been a big thing in it's, 2021. It's been a big gardens. issue for home gardeners. It has me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ellen's given up on her allotment. I've given yeah. up on my allotment this year now. I'm so yeah. done with it. <laughs> and then you have some, some varieties that... Um, are suitable for the show bench so this yeah. okay. this uh, amazing it's it's a variety that's bred um for people it's a classic mm -hmm. um tomato large yeah. classic tomato but is that just by looks or will the taste be good as well are we talking about just a tomato that looks good for, for the show bench it's yeah. very much one that looks so but the, but in actual yuck. fact that that <laughs> that variety also tastes very good because uh -huh. you do know andrew tomatoes are my nemesis <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i only like the really really sweet ones or if they're salted and oiled to within an inch of their lives <laughs> okay. the only way i'll eat them so i've got the olive oil in my pocket right now <laughs> and then we've got varieties like um that looks cool. These are awesome. So, so these like are kind tiger. of yeah, Tigerella. they're kind of like a, a reddy orange with beautiful green yeah. stripes. Um, yeah, a bit like tigerella ish Yeah, yeah. like a plum tigerella. Well, yeah. yeah, it's a variety it's called gorgeous. Bronze Torch. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's various varieties that are similar in um, to this. That's cool. And um, can we try it? Let's get a cutlery. Have you if, if you've got the olive oil? <laughs> Have you got Why am I to... smelling it? I'm, I'm, I'm treating it like it's wine. Because you <laughs> don't do? like tomatoes, so you're kind of like a bit hesitant yeah. to try it. Oh, look at that texture. It's quite That's ready for a tomato sauce, it's quite isn't a it? Meaty. Yeah. It's not mad, look. Is it like it's a cooking? Over, it's not oversweet. Or? 
It's not uh, over sweet. It's very. This sounds ridiculous, but it sounds very tomato. Okay. Mm -hmm. Intense acid. Nice. Yeah. A nice. So for tomato. cooking or fresh or yeah. nice yeah. and sauce, salad. I reckon. Okay. I won't eat it all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'll just chuck it down. Yeah. And then you've got varieties like Ariel that um, actually sun dry on the plant. Oh wow, that's, oh, that's cool. cool. Um, so you just leave them on the plant, mm -hmm. um, and they dry themselves to an intense flavour. Mm. Wonderful. How did anybody ever realise that happened? Did you leave, just leave some tomatoes <laughs> in a greenhouse one day? <laughs> I, I, I think the breeder in that particular, in, that's what he was uh -huh. breeding for. So he, he, he bred a variety that's got a, um, quite a thin skin. Uh -huh. I want to know some varieties <laughs> that accidentally happened. <laughs> um, oh, we've got, we've got a visitor as well. There's oh, a yeah, cockerel. Oh, yeah. That's the wrong time of day. <laughs> And then you have the, the indigo varieties, oh, which obviously that, start yeah. off... Yeah, um, how do you know when they're ripe, these kind of black ones? Normally by feel. Mm -hmm. So, indigo blueberries, which is this particular variety, when it ripe, it actually goes... They're red? Yeah. <laughs> That's a con. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right. you. So, when they're purple, they're really hard, underripe. Mm -hmm. And then they ripen to that ready colour. <laughs> I don't like that texture. No? Sorry, we're both trying the tomato yeah. now. That's horrible. Oh! <laughs> I thought she was going to be polite and pretend no. to like it. Sorry, I couldn't. <laughs> but so I'll tell you what. This is for the aesthetics, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah no, but also. The... This is for a 500 liker on Instagram. <laughs> Let's admit but, it. But, but also, they are much more nutritious for you, aren't they? Yeah, mm. and they've, true, true. they've got various. Um, um, chemicals inside that, that mm. um, and also can I just say when I bit into that tomato I was like ooh but now mm -hmm. I got the flavour yeah and it's actually really nice mm. so yeah and uh, you know the darker tomatoes are full <coughs> of uh, really good nutrition so and like they look mm. beautiful so yeah nice cool. yeah. I get I, yes. say, I think it's nice actually there's <laughs> more varieties so there's a number of varieties uh, we're looking. It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Hummer. It's <laughs> called the Tomato Hummer. It's massive. We're looking at for the first time, so which is why they're all under code numbers. Yeah. Okay. So it's the first time that they've been trialled in this country. Right. Um, and they're coming from all around the world, so we need to try them under our conditions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, How exciting! I, yeah. I'm I'm genuinely excited <laughs> just being here and seeing all of these varieties to try. What would be um? Have you got any kind of tips for the home garden when it comes to growing tomatoes? I mean, we're often talking about there's lots of different advice kind of swimming around, but what would you say kind of like the basic kind of free tips to grow good tomatoes? Well, America? I think you have to continually. Um, work with so you have to continuously side shoot this particular mm -hmm. type you have to continuously uh, water and feed them mm -hmm. it's not something that you can leave for any on your <laughs> <laughs> Tell me uh, about it. <laughs> see I, i'm a typical lazy gardener because mm. i don't grow any of these determinate or semi-determinate right. varieties mm. i just plant a few patio tomatoes straight uh -huh. into the garden water and feed them don't side shoot them. Yeah. But yeah. the patio ones, they're the ones you don't have to side shoot, yeah. they kind of build yeah. out. You just let them Do grow. they taste just as good though? Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. sweet. They're really, mm. really lovely. We'll Sometimes show you some in a minute. Big, are they? No. But they're so they're mm. lovely, yeah. bright red mm. and lovely sweet. Generally they're generally they're small cocktails. Yeah. Small no. cherry tomatoes. Yeah. But I guess the no. problem there is when people pick them, they're putting their hands through the the foliage and a lot of people don't like touching the foliage, do they? The yeah, fragrance right. but I tend to, mm. I tend to, you generally can find enough to pick. Yeah. Um, you generally leave enough for an odd slug to eat on as well, yeah. so which is quite good. Um, and then you can come along in September and I pull, pull the crop up mm -hmm. and harvest everything. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but tomatoes do need attention, but you can make it slightly easier you by can having make the bushy it, yeah. ones. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go and have a look at some of the other veg because I'm so excited about some oh, of Oh, we've this got stuff to see that there. giant tomato first, though. Oh, there's Did a you great see big that? Beef steak it's tomato. the size of a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it is like a small bread of loaf, or a loaf of bread, even. <laughs> let's go and have a little look. It's so like the, a weapon. <laughs> so, the same varieties that are growing inside the polytunnel are out here as well. Um, and 
Uh, the ones outside here are doing just as well. Well, by looking at them from, you know, from my eye, they look amazing out here. Yeah. They, they seem to have actually ripened out a little bit earlier outside than they did in, in the in the tunnel this year. Because it's just been the weirdest weather, hasn't mm. it? No sun, yeah. basically. Yes. <laughs> uh, they've suffered a little bit in the last week or two with the very cold nights, but... Yeah, they look good. I, I'd be super happy if I had Love my tomato plant looking <laughs> like this right now. And the, there's a little bit of blight beginning, but yeah, not too much. With yeah. this giant one here, which is literally the size of a baby's head, <laughs> would, would that taste good or what? Uh, what would the texture be like? Yeah, it would be a really yeah. quite a solid, um, mm -hmm. um, but very good to slice on, mm -hmm. on burgers or in a salad. Yeah. Uh, again, with mozzarella or uh -huh. olive oil, tastes really good. But does the plant need any extra support? Because that's quite a weight. Sometimes it? you have to support yeah. the fruit. It's quite a it's quite a weight. You can see on that particular plant, the sheer weight has yeah, actually yeah. Yeah. brought the brought the trust down. We're getting that straight on TikTok later. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. It's <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> I think that's Tigerella type, but almost like a modernised mm. version. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a cool. number of varieties there. That variety is called Sparky. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, there's a lot of these striped colours, chocolate, mm -hmm. um, becoming more and more popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they need to taste good because Tigerella was traditional kind of acidic yeah. type one, but you need yeah. them that taste nice. My favourite stripey is green zebra. Okay, yeah, it is, and it tastes good. I like yeah, it a lot. It's lovely. And one of the um, uh, darker tomatoes I'd grown was indigo star. Yep. And I really like that because you can tell when it's ripe because it has a little star shape, a yep. star on the top, oh, doesn't it? Yeah. It That's kind of cool. turns colour yeah. and you know uh -huh. then when it's ripe, which is quite cool. So I guess like asking like what are consumers really looking like, looking for with tomatoes, I guess it's just newness, differentness, isn't it? It's, yeah. I think there's it's still, endless. there's consumers, there's some consumers still buy the favourites. Mm. The old favourites that they always have bought. Oh, what, you mean those unripe orange ones <laughs> that you get in Morrison's? But more and more, <laughs> more and more people are looking for, for difference, uh, different flavor. textures. I think people go on holiday in Spain or Greece mm. and they know how a tomato should taste. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you. I, these are some of the patio mm -hmm. varieties. And, um, so these are brand new varieties that haven't been... <laughs> It's like a plummy sun gold. Yeah. I like sun gold. Thank you. Yeah, me too, actually. Oh, that's, that's the sort of tomato I'd eat. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, that's really nice. So it's that's that's, really good. It's, this is, is the type of tomato, literally, you just plant it, water it, feed it. Mm -hmm. My kind of tomato. And that's what it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's why um, I nicknamed these touch-free tomatoes, because you never have to touch them apart from pickling them, no. because you don't have to take the side yeah. shoots off. No. Yeah, yeah. they're really good. And these frames really help. But you often see them growing like that in the US. You know, this gardener's supply company, mm. they make sort of frames like this. We don't do that in the UK, though, do we? This, we tend to do perfect. single cordons, yeah. This they is very much a, a, a US mm. cage. Mm. I guess we're very kind of obsessed with growing tomatoes in a certain way mm. in the UK, but there are different ways to do it. Anyway. I always yeah. think have a go at growing them however you want to grow yeah. them, you know. Right, what's next then? Let's have the, a look at some other The Greek birds. salad of Cambridgeshire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look over here. Um, what about peas? Yeah, we'd love yeah. to look at the peas. Let, why don't we go down to the end first? Oh, we've already got our eye on a couple, peas. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we found some that look pretty amazing, so... So these are, what you're looking here is at sugar snaps. Yeah, and that's so, a market that's really grown, hasn't it? So you're very much looking at the, very much at just the sugar snap, mm -hmm. eating the complete pod. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incredibly sweet, mm -hmm. very easy. But that market must have come from nowhere, because when I was a kid, that wasn't, we didn't really know. I saw it in seed catalogues, but I certainly didn't see it in the supermarket. No, and even yeah. even it was very stringy. Mm. Uh, where mm. now they're stringless. I love the sugar snaps. Mm. Mm. Just a lovely little snack, <laughs> aren't they? And what's better with peas? To have a shorter growing one or a taller one? Or? I think it depends on everybody's circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, commercial growers tend to grow because they're growing in fields without any support. Mm -hmm. They tend to grow for shorter ones. 
Mm -hmm. Particularly the Ophelia type, where they they have their leaf, semi leafless, mm -hmm. um, so they've got the extra tendrils to hold themselves up. But does that mean they put more energy into the pods then, mm. and not the leaves? Yeah, yeah, generally. Uh -huh. So basically, we're we're standing by some peas mm. uh, for our listeners, and there's barely any foliage. It's like all <laughs> tendrils. They probably look too ugly to grow at home, <laughs> they if we're look honest. Ugly, yeah. but I think they look really actually yeah. quite funky. Yeah, yeah, and at yeah. the end of the day, when you're growing them, you aren't growing them for Instagram. Yeah, if you, you want are better growing crops, them for yeah. a good crop and tasty yeah. food, you know. What would you say like that? You'd get double the crop or 25%? or 25%. Yeah, okay, so it's worth it. 25% mm. mm. more crop, mm. less foliage, lots of yeah. tendrils. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, peas can be decorative as well as, you know, hard workers in the garden because. Look at this one. Isn't this amazing? Golden pods and the flowers are not only this lovely mauve, but as they fade, they go to this pure azure blue. So you get three amazing colors on one plant. Now, aesthetically, that's great, but does it taste good? Yeah. Yeah? I'm going to try it. Why don't you it's a, try it? <laughs> it's a golden snap. Mm -hmm. It's quite a traditional variety. Mm. It's nice. It's quite tall, isn't it, as well? Mm. It's quite good. Mm -hmm. um, particularly grown early in the season mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's very much a heritage type variety. Mm -hmm. Yeah it's really nice. But heritage, does that mean it's still quite an old variety so it doesn't have modern vigour or it, or it does? It, it's, it's got good vigour, mm -hmm. um, what it hasn't got and you'll, you can see it on these plants, it hasn't got the protection from Mildew. Mildew, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, so, so heritage varieties can be strong, but they don't necessarily have the disease resistance. Correct. The latest yeah. breeding. Um, okay. But early in the season, peas and snap peas don't tend to suffer from mildew. Mm -hmm. It's only in the midsummer that they they tend to have this problem. So is then then a good idea to get your pea crops in early and get it done. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to grow a, a pea crop in the main season. That's when maybe some of the more modern varieties are, okay. are better to use uh -huh. um, because they're the ones that tend to have the, um, the mildew resistance bred into them. Well, so, yeah, it's funny, talking about resistance, I don't know if you realise that online, on Instagram, there's a real kind of drama sometimes about people growing hybrids, mm -hmm. even F1 hybrids. But that, to us, we've worked in the industry for years and it's kind of really quite normal to have something that's bred. That doesn't mean it's like some terrifying kind of GM kind of, you know. What Did you know that people get quite hit up about this online? They're like, I don't want to grow no hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> we're aware that certain people like um, um, more OP mm. heritage type varieties. Um, but there's nothing to fear from hybrid. Yeah, of course. Hybrid. No. It's silly. Absolutely yeah. nothing to fear. And you must make life easy for yourself. But this pea, I think, is a great example that you could use the heritage ones earlier in the season. Then when you're going for late cropping, use something that's more modern. So then you're balancing yeah, out. You're not it. you're not surrendering to F1 hybrids all the time. So, yeah. yeah we love that one on the yeah, end as well. One on the end is but there's no pods. Where are the pods? They're coming. Here's one. Yeah? Oh, they're, oh, they're purple ones. Uh -huh. But these flowers, I would grow this as as a climber, mm. almost as if it was a sweet pea. It's yeah, that good looking, isn't it? Look, it's, really a tall, it's a cut flower as well. Look. Really tall, really look strong. That. It looks like a sweet pea. <laughs> Lovely purple pods. Ooh. Really, really nice. Gorgeous. Really nice. There's no pods because every time I come down here... Really... <laughs> <laughs> so this is your favourite, right? <laughs> I can see like three pods oh. on a whole lot yeah. of plants because you're eating them clearly. I'm eating them <laughs> as soon as they come out here. <laughs> but that is just beautiful and for screening as well to cover a fence. Yeah, it's sweet pea territory for me. It's, it's perfect for the inevitable ornamental, isn't it? Mm. Really Actually, nice. Actually, before we move on from peas, like how, how do people breed in different colours? Do people focus on breeding different coloured flowers now that, you know, vegetables have become more ornamental and people are growing them in different ways? Or is it just when there's a new coloured flower, it just kind of just happens? It tends to. Yeah. There is, we're doing some pea breeding at the moment mm. um, and we're trying to breed in this, um, this type of colour mm. into some short peas. Okay. Um, and um, so it is... It is happening, and people do target the colours. Uh -huh. um, but in a lot of cases, it's it's been accidental. Uh huh. Um, but, um, mm, because I'm just imagining it I might. Edible ornamentals is becoming more. Of a... mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think so too. I'm just imagining in my kind of 
crazy magician's brain. If you could have a sweet pea that you grew all the season, and Ellen's grown sweet peas for like, she's been cutting them for like eight, ten weeks this Nearly season. Nearly ten weeks now. And they're still then yeah. going to go to seed, but wouldn't it be great at the point where they create a pod that is edible? Yeah. That I would know. be cool, edible it sweet peas. And then you get the best of both worlds. You get that flower display, like we see here, mm. but then you get a crop on it as well. Yeah. And that brings a garden pea into much more longer lasting territory of yeah. a garden plant as well. So I couldn't agree yeah. more. I would love mm. it if my sweet peas. Let's were put that on our notepad, well. Ellen. That's on our wish list. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a big ask, but you know, you've got to aim high. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 What do you yeah. want to look at next? What's what are you um, hungry for? Um, I'm <laughs> hungry for some, well, not that I would actually eat them raw in any way, but there's squash over there. Mm -hmm. You've got some great big eat squash. Raw squash. You can uh, spaghetti no, I it. would prefer not yeah. to. Oh. <laughs> it's not meat, is it? I like them, <laughs> I, I prefer them cooked, so it's oh. not meat. <laughs> Ellen, you're such a snob sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I want my squash cooked. <laughs> I would like my squash cooked. But you know what, like any vegetable sort of tender. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So there, there's lots of lettuce, there's some oriental vegetables, green beans. I love that one. Loads. The, one that the vintage colour. It's about halfway up. Can you see that, Andrew? There's a lettuce that there's kind a, of oh, yes. looks a bit yeah. antique looking. Yeah. It's like shabby chic lettuce. Yeah, it's really nice. Savannah. Savannah. Yeah. yeah. Which one is it, sorry? Savannah. It's a Polish one. I remember you had quite a few rubbish last year. Correct. Yeah. 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 Is it quite a lot of breeding in Poland, vegetables? Um, traditional, traditional yeah. breeding, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But is it sometimes that you might be selecting varieties from overseas that are not necessarily new, but they're new to us? Does that Correct. happen as well? Correct, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that colour is amazing. So it's like a gentle, rusty yeah. reddish with the green tinge as well. It looks antique. It's if very pretty. If a lettuce pretty. could ever be sexy, that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Lorna Coe and I'm a garden guest on QVC UK and I love my garden gadgets. So I'm really thrilled that Michael and Ellen have kindly asked me to talk today about some of my favourite garden tools and gadgets to help make your life easier on the plant-based podcast. So first of all, if you hear some snoring, apologies, it's my dog Sky. She's on my lap. I don't have the heart to move her. But I thought, do you know what? I'm going to start off by going down memory lane because as a kid growing up in the late 70s, we didn't have the huge garden centres that we have now. We didn't have the websites where you could click and order anything you want. We didn't have the supermarket selling plants and tools and hose pipes. And we didn't have QVC where you could just watch and learn and then order things that are going to help your life become so much easier when you're out and about in the garden. So we had the nurseries, which was what we called the garden centres. And on a Sunday afternoon, my parents, sometimes my grandparents, would do maybe some pick your own fruit picking like strawberries. Then we'd go around the nursery, look at what they had on offer. But to be honest, the gadgets and things, there wasn't much there. And then, hope you know, have a nice cup of tea at the end of it. But fast forward to 2022. And the amazing variety of gadgets out there and tools to help is just incredible. So today I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of four of my favourites that can help you out. So the first two are from Joe and the team at The Grumpy Gardener. Now, this is an amazing UK-based company. They either reinvent tools and give them totally ingenious ways of using them in a new way, or they come out with totally brand new tools you've never seen before. So my first top pick is the one-handed pair of garden shears. They're like a giant pair of scissors for the garden. The blades rotate 180 degrees, so you can do clipping, pruning, opening compost bags, bird food cutting your weed mats, your string, even opening boxes, so things like Joe's um, Grumpy Gardener Fat Balls, it's incredible for, and you can use them left or right-handed. And I think they're so lightweight, so easy to take around with you. They do so many jobs, they're just a must-have. And I have a little news flash for the plant-based podcast listeners. Joe's launching a brand new design uh, this season, which has blades that swivel 360 degrees instead of 180, new locking mechanism and a new streamlined design. So you heard it here first. Now, the other product from Joe I love is his brand new lightweight digging fork. You've got to check this out. It's on qvcuk.com. It's a fork reinvented. Full-size garden fork, super lightweight, 1.9 kilos. It's really lightweight, but it has two blades in between the fork prongs. So it's 
almost like a fork and a spade combined. So you can cut through hard soil, clay, chalk, roots as you're turning over the earth. So this for me, because it's lightweight and it does two jobs in one, is just so, so clever and so different. And the two middle prongs are actually, they go into one in the center. So you've got far more power when you're digging into the soil. So they're two from Joe that I really, really rate. The second two are from Tom Shepard and the team at SFIX, another amazing company. Now, the first are actually a pair of glasses. You might think that's a bit strange for the garden, but it's Tom's magnifying LED light glasses. You get two pairs. They give you, what is it, 160% magnification. That's 1.6 times bigger than the naked eye can see. They have two lights either side. You charge them up so you don't need batteries. They're cordless. And then, say you're in the shed, it's a bit dark, and you want to read the back of a seed or bulb packet. You want to check your fertilizer levels are correct, like Richard Jackson's um, flower power. You want to get it right. You can light up the shed, because a lot of sheds don't have, you know, lights in there, and you can see 1.6 times bigger than the naked eye. So that's another top pick for me for the garden. And then finally, Tom has come up with the most ingenious product. It's called Blackout Paint. It is something that will transform... Things like cast iron furniture, flower brackets, um, the hanging basket brackets, things like chimeneas, old pots, anything that looks tired and drab after the winter months. You don't have to sandpaper first. If there's massive chunks of rust, just you know, brush them off with a wire brush. But then there's no more sandpapering papering because this blackout paint will literally rust convert prime and paint, you get a one litre pot, if that will cover about two square metres. Just go online and check out some of the amazing transformations that Tom has done. So whether you do want to get that chimney, don't worry, it goes up to 250 degrees Celsius of blackout paint. Whether you're putting on a plant pot, it will withstand temperatures down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. So anything you want to transform and instantly make look amazing, especially cast iron furniture, no sandpapering needed, just paint it on, Half an hour it's touched dry, three hours later it's fully dry. That for me is one of the must-have products of the season. So hopefully these have been helpful and I hope you have an amazing spring summer and enjoy your time in your gardens and balconies. squash because I know lots of our listeners love to grow squash and this well you know autumn time of course is the time where they're all over so oh, look there's a little pan but, you oh, know, little patty pan, a little patty pan. Cute. how very cute beautiful isn't it aren't they fabulous but don't you think like it's I look so at that cute. and I'm thinking I know how big they can get yeah. that seems like a waste of time it's like why didn't you get any bigger <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not being well, ungrateful. Will, but will if you leave will, it. If you How many would that it? produce? Because, um, you know, Ellen, come back with a mic. <laughs> you know, um, like very often in uh, Eastern European shops, you can buy them uh, pickled, mm. but they're only about that big. Yeah. So, like, if you're growing a plant, how many is the plant going to give you that are that big? Oh, between 20 and 30. Uh-huh. Okay. It's just like growing a courgette yeah. plant. And I you guess get the quicker you pick courgettes. them. But if you pick them quicker, they, the then you, you get more. Them, they mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. these are lovely. You just, <coughs> I do. I just think grate they're them uh-huh. in salad. Yeah. That's, I've never grown squash willingly, you see. Do Only you ever by accident. Do you like giving one for your front garden? Yeah. Is it growing? Not really. Oh, no, I wonder yeah. why. I wonder if it's too crowded. Which sounds ironic, but mm. I think there's a lot of other plants around it, so perhaps it then got a bit too wet and mildewy, maybe. Don't know. So these squash here, you these look uh, fabulous. fabulous. What are these ones? These are griller, uh, green grillers. Green so grillers. these are these are the perfect squash for barbecuing. Okay. All right. Hence the name. Yeah. <laughs> so they're a little bit more solid. Yeah. So you can just quarter them. Yeah. Just put them straight on the barbecue. Nice. And they don't. They don't disintegrate in the same way as a, a cool. normal summer squash does. <laughs> right. A little bit meatier. Um, so they're ideal for that summer barbecue. Mm-hmm. They're a lovely deep green and a really great shape as well, mm. actually, aren't they? Yeah. So, yeah, that's really so cool. So you say you'd quarter them? Yeah, just quarter them and just put them straight on the mm-hmm. barbecue. Or you can cut them into chunks mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. put them on veg, kebabs and those. Normally when you, when you take a summer squash, 
-hmm. and you try and put it onto a <coughs> skewer, yeah. mm -hmm. more of it ends up in the barbecue than you actually end up eating. <laughs> yeah, because it's a very watery middle. Yeah. 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 Where there these are a little bit meatier, so they're ideal. That's great, there you go. Green gorilla, Look guys. At that. Isn't that beautiful, the flowers? Yeah. yeah. And don't forget to cook the flowers. I know. But we don't do that much in the UK, but I imagine in some countries, are varieties bred for flower production? Certain varieties yeah. produce more flowers. Yeah. They're not particularly bred, but they do produce more flowers. So they'd be the ones to harvest, yeah. yeah. But that's yeah. really cool. Isn't it? Lovely, aren't they? Oh, pass yeah. me the ricotta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yellow ones, I always think they're better because you, you won't miss them. So you ne that'll never become a marrow like that's hidden true. under a leaf, will yeah, it? Yeah, that's very true. Ella's well, you'll, always you'll, got a flat, of course. Yeah. Oh you'll God. see some of the varieties that we've actually got here are there. The reason why we've got them here and we're trialling them is they're a little bit more open, and they're not as they're not the as habit of the plant. and they're not as spiky on the leaves, mm. and that's to um, to get them so that they're easy to pick. Does that also make them better for patio growing as well? If you're growing them in a pot. Yeah, because yeah. they're not going to run off everywhere. Correct. And yeah. also perhaps mm -hmm. less mildew because mm -hmm. there's better airflow. You know, Absolutely. on my squash yeah, patch, yeah, yeah. we're just now. I'm just now getting a fair bit of mildew. Mildew coming. And really, I should have trimmed away some foliage and had a bit of mm. clear up. But you know, yeah. there's always mm. a load to do. So actually, to have a squash plant that's already very open in its habit, mm. not only can you see yeah. those squash that are <laughs> always hiding and you leave them for two days and go back and there's a marrow, um, but yeah, it would probably help the airflow and mildew mm. perhaps. Well, anything that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Because when yeah. Ellen, like, she gives the courgettes away as gifts during the summer, she thinks they're gifts, but they're not. She's just trying to get all everything. Get rid of the yeah. Don't tell everyone. <laughs> Don't tell everyone that. Uh. <laughs> Oh, I do like these kind of pale green ones, though. They're really... Mm. I love the look of those. Yeah, they're, th mm. they're really nice. Mm. Um, but we dead don't straight. buy those, like, in UK. Like, not, UK not, as many. Dark green. No. not as many. Not as many. I'm often uh, going to the Romanian shop, and they, that is the courgette that they would have. Well, mm. when yeah. you harvest them also small, any courgette, mm. you can pickle them, you can yeah. fry them, you can How's grill them. How's your fermentation like, going? Fermentation's it's going done. good, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you eaten them yet? Uh, no. Because I was always impatient when I do stuff like I always, that. No, it's not time yet, but they're oh, just right. about done. So, yeah, I've, um, I've fermented courgette with lemon and dill this year, so we'll see how that goes. But, yeah, it's looking very good. He's a right little chef. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> interesting experimentation. I love these. I love the colour of these. These are a light green with kind of mottled mm, green. A Lebanese type. Right. Oh, yeah, a little. It's kind of one next to it. <laughs> like a handle. <laughs> Yeah, what a beautiful colour. <laughs> uh, can you tell us... Uh, shapes, different colours, that's what we... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like um, it. Very so nice. Tell us about the beans, actually, the dwarf beans, because you said they're a little bit late, they're about two weeks late this season, but this has actually given us an opportunity to see how beautiful they are mm. in flower. Yeah. Because this... I'd love this in my patio pots. Mm. It's beautiful. That incredible. Yeah. It's got this really, it's like a Dolacos Lab Lab, you know that climbing plant with our hyacinth bean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's almost those course. colours, it's yeah. amazing. And it's, it and it's purple podded when it's, oh. when the pods oh, come, no, they're, I don't, I don't care they're purple me pods. pods yeah. like <laughs> How different we are, because I'd be all about the pods <laughs> and you're all about the flowers. <laughs> I just imagine like to change up a patio pot and have something that looks quite different. And look at the bees, they're still loving it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they're very cool. I remember last time I was here, Andrew, you were talking about commercially grown dwarf beans. They want them all to ripen at the same time because then they harvest the whole plant. Yeah. And so we were saying, like, people at home could sow them in succession and then pull up the whole plant and then you haven't got that awkward kind of picking them in situ kind of situation. So yeah. you literally just take the plant and that's it. But there's, a, there's also enough varieties that mm. continue. If you continue to pick them as they become, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll um, produce beans for such a long period mm, okay um, but yeah commercially yeah. they're looking for a for now a variety that you can machine harvest yeah. so it's a it's a single pick um and um they just want to go through once which is what some of these varieties mm -hmm. are in here mm -hmm. for trial for That's cool. uh, it's always interesting new ways to grow stuff mm, yeah. definitely and all the corn as well. You've got loads of sweet corn growing here too. I knew, I saw somebody online the other day who, um, in order to try and keep the rats off the corn on their allotment, yeah. they've covered each cob with a sock. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Protect it. But wouldn't they sweat or not? Or what? I 
I don't, I don't think so, no. Hopefully they've used clean. I think they look new, to be honest. <laughs> Pop socks. Funnily enough, it, it said I've raided the sock drawer, but actually they all look like brand new socks. So, um, so oh, you know, I, just when you harvest corn, I honestly think it must be one of the best things yeah, to harvest wow. on the allotment. And you can eat that completely raw, can't you? And it will just taste the it sweetest. Tastes, I think it's oh. one of it's one of the. I think it's one of the. <laughs> Look at that. The vegetables that is so different. Yeah. When you harvest it yeah. and eat it oh, fresh compared so to. Um, is that half Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Go on, Ellen. I'm Stop gonna me talking munch. for a minute. <laughs> I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna munch. We now you're gonna hear us munch. That was really milky. Mm -hmm. Remember mm. that? That was brilliant. Mm. Mm. Oh my god! You wouldn't usually eat them fresh. No. That is so good. No. And actually, that's another question. How do you, like, you're here, you're growing new varieties, you're testing them against existing ones, kind of new breeding. How do you really taste test? Because surely you're taste testing everything raw, or do you cook some stuff? No, up? we do. T we do yeah. cook some up, okay. um, and we have different people take it and, and cook it up, mm. um, and then the, there's taste panels that um, taste it against. Um, current varieties. Oh my Who God. are they? Are there any vacancies? <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we can also, um, we've also got equipment that you can uh, measure the sweetness oh, yeah. of, of various vegetables. Mm -hmm. So we take um, sugar levels, sweetness levels of things like sweet corn to see mm -hmm. how sweet they are. And you just literally me measure the, um, the milkiness that comes out of the sweet corn. What's so okay. interesting, this is absolutely gorgeous, is it, you know, when you're a home grower and you buy your seeds and you grow them, me included until really the last year or two, you don't really know what is going into breeding those seeds in the first place. You know what I mean? All the stuff Sorry, that goes that on <laughs> before you buy your food in the supermarket or before you purchase your packet of seeds, you know, you have no idea mm. how it's got to that point. Like this is, you know, breeding, it's trialling, it's tasting, it's cooking, mm -hmm. it's like sweetness levels, all those yeah. things before you even get to have it in your garden or on a supermarket shelf. Yeah, so have you got, um, like, wh which varieties have you specifically bred? What would be your kind of biggest selling vegetable variety? That Probably tomatoes. To? Tomatoes. And what is the kind of breeding cycle of that then? How many years are we talking to create a new tomato variety? Between five and eight years Okay. Mm -hmm. to bring a new variety. Um, sometimes it's faster if, if you've bred certain um, characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, you've, you already have at least one of the parents mm -hmm. um, in place before you... Um, so you can... If you've got a variety that's, that's got good late blight resistance and mm -hmm. it's a good tasting variety and you just want to change the colour, mm -hmm. that's normally a little bit easier than okay. starting to breed. Um, but normally five to eight years. Okay. <laughs> mm, I'm still eating. We know. Yeah. <laughs> slow, slow. We're gonna we're gonna try one more. Okay. Okay. Because you <coughs> do you grow those jewel ones, the rainbow ones, or are they? They're not worth it for flavour. They're just for decoration, right? Yeah. Or are you about to show me a bright purple one? No, no. <laughs> one. This. I'll just put it down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so polite. Well, yeah, I don't want to just throw it. <laughs> we go round at the end of the day. Okay. So this is a variety called Picnic, so it's a slightly smaller cob, as you can see. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's a picnic cob. And it was a variety that was introduced a number of years ago and then has, has was lost. Oh, um, really? And now is being reintroduced. How lost? Why? The, the breeder um, stopped breeding Thank it. Thank you. And... Mm -hmm. um, and it, Stop maintaining the, it. Yeah, the breed yeah. the breeding lines got um, changed of ownership, and it's taken nearly five years to wow. to be. So it's just come back into. Um, but it's it's bred to be a variety that you almost eat raw. Okay. It's a mm. small, I want to get rid of the taste <laughs> of the other one out of my mouth before I try this one. Yeah. It's a very sweet. It's nice because uh, the weird thing is, the only time I eat raw sweet corn is when I'm here. <laughs> But you, I could buy them in the supermarket and eat them raw. They might not taste as good as they, they do on the They will not truck, have the same flavour. But they still have a goodness for me, won't they? And oh. the texture that I like. Yeah. yeah. But mm. I... It's amazing. Sweet corn should be at fresh. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm. Yes. That's yes. amazing. Mm. I it's like a, it. Yeah. It's very different. Really lush also. Mm. About just taking a cob off the corn and just like munching it. It's, it's a bit milky. It's it? a bit like the first garden peas. They never get home, do no, they? Because you, you eat you them. You can't wait to eat them, right? That's what this is like. It's mm. lovely. Wow. Well, well, a question actually about storage of vegetables. Like most of the things here, would you be storing them in the fridge when you put them on? A, mi a mixture. Yeah. Um, so things like tomatoes, um, aubergines, I would tend to store not out of the fridge mm. okay. um, because the taste deteriorates. And then other things. Store quite happily in the yeah. fridge. Onions? Out. Onions out. Yeah. yeah. Let's we'll do a quiz show. Green yeah. beans, in or out? <laughs> in. In, yeah. definitely. Okay. Lettuce. Yeah. In. Yeah. Yeah. Peas. Yeah. In. Eggs. Eggs out. <laughs> See, that's a great divider of people as well, isn't it? <laughs> oh. Still in the hen, hopefully. <laughs> Are you done yet, Ellen? No, no, I can't eat as quick as you, clearly. <laughs> Right, so what we've got next? We've got time to look at a few more bits. Right. I'm, I'm asking you like you're the boss, but are you really? <laughs> Absolutely. I am, yes. What about... Uh, so you tried you tried this turnip. Oh, God, oh, yeah. yeah. I took one for her as well. Her. She loved it. <laughs> and she's hard to her. please. <laughs> <laughs> so this year, they're not as big. Yeah, but they're sweet. Yeah. Cool. So, I love turnips, and I know they can be a divider only because so many they can people be so are used woody to big and, yeah. woody turnips. If you harvest them when they're not big, massive, mm. chunky things, generally they are super tasty, raw, cooked, whatever. I love them. Um, so these are Tokyo Silky Sweet. <laughs> Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. And they actually do look like a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a picture of this. <laughs> right, let's go. You go first. So you would then use these in salads, etc. Yeah. 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 Yeah, just slice them in a salad. No need to cook them. Mm, that's cool. But even the texture is amazing. Mm. It's mm. quite soft. Mm. Um, yeah, it's brilliant. Quite it's soft. soft yet hard. It's like <laughs> the texture is like Turkish Delight. Okay. Yeah, kind of jelly-like but solid. Mm. Yeah. It's very different. Mm. And it's, <laughs> I think it's, the, amazing. it's um it's unexpected as well. Mm. I think that's the biggest you expect it to be turnip taste and it's just nothing it's like just a turnip. It's just super mm. silky smooth. Yeah. Is this now available in the shops? Mm. It is, mm. yes. <laughs> yes. Um as seed. I as mean. seed. Yeah, as well as seeds. Mm. Wow. So we recommend Tokyo Silky Sweet for sure. Mm. That's really beautiful. Nice. And these are all growing also in a massive pot, so you could grow these at home either. Mm, definitely. And you would harvest them at golf ball size, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good. Okay, cool. Uh, Should we go and look at some peppers? Yeah. Oh, peppers, that would be good. Because you, you like a hot pepper. <laughs> Come down <and> look. <laughs> Just so you know, I won't be trying a hot pepper. <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> There's uh, salad leaves on the, in the ground. <coughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And high up as well, which makes it easier. Easy to pick. Yeah. It's like how they do strawberries these days. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So we've got um, <coughs> some hot peppers and some sweet peppers. So down this side is mostly hot peppers, mm -hmm. um, different shapes, sizes, that different cool. heats. That's the one that they often put cheese inside, isn't it? Mm, yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. It's not particularly hot. Um, <laughs> cool. It's more of oh, a... Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. So you buy them in the um, little pots with cheese. Oh, what are they called? Pepper dew? No. Stuffed yeah? cheese, pepper yeah. peas. <laughs> They're really, look at the beautiful colour of them. <laughs> like um, snooker balls. Oh, that's Aren't they wonderful? Really are. That's cool, I love that. But that's kind of mild to hot. It's a mild. Yeah. I, I describe it as it's got a little bit of a, a tang to it. It's not really hot. Where some surely, of the other are. Surely a demon orange is hot. Yes. <laughs> Pepper hot demon orange F1. <laughs> 
Give that's her gonna, that one. That's gonna be hot. No, I'm definitely not trying hot peppers. <laughs> I love the colour actually of them. Really vibrant orange. That's very cool. Rocky. And then you've got Damien. I don't know why, but that sounds hot and yeah, bad. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got its brothers, Killian and Christian, which are... Killian, Christian and Damien. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good names. Six, six, six. Yeah, so we've got a yellow, an orange and a red, so... Very oh, cool. Right. I actually really love uh, pepper plants, chili pepper plants. I think they look they really do cool. look nice, yeah. yeah. very cool. And they're perennial as well, aren't they? Yeah, and also you can, you know, you can plant them up with ornamentals as well, like a big yeah. plant, they kind of... Oh, you can't, really you see cool. that variegated one, you definitely can. Mm. That's a really Very cool pretty. one. Wow. Fireworks, which I think is a lovely looking... Mm. It's quite bushy, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and, and Candelabra-like. Like, <laughs> and when leaves. all of those fruits turn red, mm. it's mm. going to look stunning. Fireworks, yeah. Very I nice. guess this is another crop where you've seen a huge uh, increase in interest, right? Very much yeah, so. with yeah. chili festivals and all that jazz. That wasn't around when I was younger. People have um, really taken to mm. eating more and more chilies now. Yeah. And um, sort of a, a really large jalapeno type, which of course gets that cracking in mm. when they ripen. But um, big. It's a really large. So is the cracking a good thing or not? Or see, in some countries. It just does it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then you've What's got this. This doesn't look like a <laughs> pepper, does it? It's a real weird and wonderful. But that's that looks like a fasolis plant. Okay. Yeah, it's got that kind of furriness to it, hasn't it? But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's very much a, a jungle, strange jungle oh, pepper. Yeah, it? Jungle pepper. That's a cool phrase. Oh yeah. Is this a test then? This is the first time you've seen this one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very much first. Uh -huh. But it's much more attractive, isn't it? That. It's quite. Yeah. The flowers just look like aubergine. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So that's oh, look, the variegated and then, ones. And then oh, some of the variegated ones. Oh, they're very cool. They are. Oh, my gosh. Stunning, so, aren't they? everyone's fangirling over these peppers in the corner of the greenhouse they now. Are so amazing. Wow. But these have started to be listed now, right? I think I've seen them in. We in have catalogues or? None of these. No? There, oh. are, there are odd variegated ones that's. Oh, that's, okay. But, um, Beautiful. Oh, these are, these were originally bred by a university in in America. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, we're now selecting and okay. now producing the seed for those those varieties for the future. So these are sweet ones. These, these ones are all sweet ones. Eat, right? yeah. 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 I have to be honest. I do very often choose vegetables even based on the name. Like if <laughs> I know I want to grow pepper, a sweet pepper, for example, and I can't decide because there's quite a few. I'll go, oh, I like that name, or well, that reminds me of something, I'll pick that. Didn't, you know, because I'm assuming that by the time I'm growing them and getting the seeds, they've been tested, they've been bred for certain reasons. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. You're like those people that bet on horses from the name, not from their form. <laughs> but that's if I was to bet on a horse, that's exactly what I would do. <laughs> so, yes. So basically, I really like that. It was Lady Lou. Lady so I Lou. would probably grow Lady mm. Lou just because I like the name. <laughs> And if it was a horse, and you backed on horses, you'd back on Lady Lou, wasn't it? Lady Lou, absolutely. But actually, this one that Michael's now looking at is very nice. Oh, that's really cool, isn't it? I always remember when I was a kid, like salivating over the seed catalogues, and I always remember there was a rainbow pepper collection that I always wanted to grow, but kind of it wasn't. It wasn't that easy to get them to fruiting stage, like, you know, when I was a kid, so I wasn't an experienced grower. Mm. Not that I am now, at all. <laughs> but it was just, yeah, it was amazing. And I was always amazed by this kind of white pepper. Mm. Yeah. And I remember, like, you know, when you're a kid, you kind of spend so much time looking in certain books and catalogues. And I remember always just, I don't know, if I was, if I was a bit simple, I was just staring at this picture of this rainbow peppers. And I was, was. amazed by all the different colours. Did colors. you say was? <laughs> <laughs> but I just loved it. It was amazing. So this so, one is, yeah. is it Amicus or Amicus? Yeah. F1. Yeah. And uh, beautiful, wonderful, it's a, it's creamy. It's a hung, Hungarian cream pepper. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So they tend, those, that type tends to come from Eastern Europe. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Very uh, nice. Traditional pepper in that. I mean, well, there's just so many to choose from at the end of the day. <laughs> What's really exciting about it is that these are all, you know, will, are or will be available in the supermarkets and in seed packets so that you Definitely. can grow them at home. Oh, can we not just quickly look at the root veg before we go? Have we got time, Ellen? Ellen's always so worried about the time. She's so square. It's a very long episode. 
We've got 11 minutes. People will love it. If we don't talk about carrots, we'll go down in the charts. Okay. <laughs> That's I, your worry, pal. I don't honestly. think we will, but okay. People sure. won't mind. <laughs> Please write in and tell Ellen that she's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send us a letter. <laughs> but, you know, if people ain't getting carrots, they're going to be annoyed. That's the thing. There's a big carrot movement. <laughs> Is there? Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Amongst rabbits all I over the world. I was going to say, I haven't seen that one yet. But sure, because the bee girl won't be love carrots. Exactly. So I want a quick overview of carrots and the bee. This year... I'm very aware. I've only got ten and a half minutes. Okay, fine. <laughs> this year, I have grown a whole variety range of Here carrots. Here we go. Andrew's got his spade All kinds out, of so. different colours. Uh, <laughs> orange, cream, the dark, dark purples. They've all been so, so tasty and thoroughly enjoyable. And I even kept carrot root fly away as well. <laughs> so all is good. But doesn't it blow your mind, Andrew, that carrot flowers are now sold by florists? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw them the other day in a place. I think it was the Dara, the red flowered one, but it was like, hello, Look that's a carrot. Those. Oh my god, yellow ones. Beautiful. So you've got a lovely yellow one. That oh, it smells amazing it as well. It takes me back to my good. childhood. Oh my god. I Finish. prefer the smell of carrot wow. foliage to tomato foliage, which I don't yeah, particularly 100%, 100%. like. Yeah, 100%. But that's really oh, gorgeous. Wow. Oh, Look at that's brill. <laughs> Perfect. And what is that variety? Schwanzador. It's a very... It's a sorry, can variety. you repeat that? <laughs> it's Schwanzador. Right, okay. uh, sorry, can variety. you repeat that three times in a row? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Another can heritage. I try a little Ooh. little nibble of a dirt coffee carrot? I'm still carrot. trying to get the corn out of my teeth. Wow, oh, that's just you, isn't it? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is cool. Really nice? Mm-hmm. Mm. Bits of um, grit and dirt. <laughs> And of course, when I was when I was working at Thompson Morgan, rainbow carrots were only just kind of appearing. But now they're really uh, commonplace, aren't they? You even get them in the supermarket. Uh, but the flavours are also so good. Mm. I don't know if they're and used better for to you. The not, purple ones. Yeah, the purple yeah. ones are so full of nutrition. Wow, wow. that's chunky. These carrots are chunky carrots. That's a meal. What? That's, that's huge. A, that's a little chantonnay. A, or, just a little or a large, large chantonnay. A very mm. large chantonnay. But should that be the smaller ones, or this is? So this is, is too big or not? Or what? Yeah, that's a little, little on the large yeah. side. But <laughs> well, it just shows what you can grow. Let's, Would that uh... affect the flavour then? Is it bad to grow it too no. big or not? No, no. that's okay. still okay. That's a meal for me. <laughs> it's just it's it's they're nice short carrots uh -huh. that can grow on sort of poorer. Look at that. Yeah, because the soil's grow. obviously very good for carrots. I was yeah. going to say you must have a nice light soil but here. They're good for pots as well, aren't they? Because they don't need the depth. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So this type yeah. is is good for cool. anybody's. That's beautiful. <laughs> and then just before we close up, let's have a little look at the beet. What have you got to show us? Well, again, there's lots of different colours. Mm. And I guess beet has become incredibly popular as well, hasn't it? So you've got the super sweet white ones. Super sweet. They're just really it's white, white beet is really sweet. I don't know if I've ever tried it. And it looks really cool when you yeah. pickle it in layers with the different colours. Mm. It, it got like a rainbow jar of beet. Uh, or really the chiogia cool. with the. Yeah. Have you ever grown that one? I've got some at home. Oh there, my gosh. Pickling. Oh wow. With the swells of white and oh. beet tree colour in the You're a swell. So nice. <laughs> oh. Look at that. It's just like eating sugar beets. Oh, I really want to try it, but that's only just come out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's really sweet. Yeah? I'm going to go in. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'll give that to you. You two can do that. <laughs> it's only a bit of dirt. It's good yeah. for your immunity. Mm, that is pretty sweet, actually. It's earthy, but sweet. I like it's that balance. It's earthy because you're eating literally mm. the earth on it. <laughs> <laughs> And there's that's a number cool. of these. So would you use the tops as well as the bottoms here? The but that's true of any beet, right? Or not? Yes. Yeah. You can yeah, eat yeah. leaves of any beet. So also but people you, don't, do you they? you don't grow them for the actual end mm. result, you can grow the leaves as micro greens as well. Mm, of course, yeah. But even when they're old and tough, you could still use them. You can yeah. stir fry them and whatnot. Yeah. Obviously oh, look at the colour! Look at that! That's vibrant. That's pink. So it's like That's a, not even purple. <laughs> that neon pink. What? So it's like a chuagia type yeah, of wow. circles. That's know, cool. Deep, vibrant pink. 
And what's this one called? This one hasn't been named yet. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Ruby slippers. And actually the foliage <laughs> is ultra dark, isn't it? It's a yeah. really dark, deep dark, maroony purple beetroot. Mm. You should call it old red eyes. <laughs> because it's because it's red, the beet is gonna stay a little bit smaller for longer. Right. Mm -hmm. Just, just naturally because it's red leaf compared to green leaf. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. Very cool. It's so it wow. is exciting Re to see yeah, so many really new events. It's really really cool. And so cool to kind of um, yeah follow you around as we kind of test test these out, talk Taste more test. about veg and such. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I had a very good time. Oh, but now I'm looking at the onions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told us we had to finish, Ella. <laughs> thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Caroline, um, this is my first time. It's like at the moment you're standing at the school disco waiting for somebody to ask. Um, but Ellen and Michael have kindly asked me to have a chat to you for a few minutes. I'm a photographer and owner of Caroline Horn Suffolk Photography who normally is hiding behind the camera and just listening to Ellen and Michael's plant musings or surrounded by guests at a wedding or photographing plants commercially or in my garden. I do enjoy a bit of gardening with my family, finding it a great escape from editing. Plus, I can combine the both, which is really good. I'm not a garden expert, often giving Michael a puzzled look when he says some Latin name, and I just stand there looking slightly vague. However, I do enjoy planting flowers, fruit and veg, to photograph its journey from a tiny seedling, pushing its way through the soil, all the way through to when it takes on a whole different look at the end of their life. Um, my favourite flowers being hydrangeas, particularly white ones, because I absolutely love how their petals become skeletons and when they get dewdrops and um, frost on them, absolute favourite. So I'm going to keep things simple and just sharing a few of my handy tips. We're not going to be talking about any fancy kit, uh, just using your smartphone because often or not um, you might just be nipping out into the garden with a spare five minutes. With spring being literally just around the corner, this is such a great time to capture those new buds and blossoms opening, snowdrops, crocus, um, cherry blossoms will be on their way soon. So just a few tips to perhaps help you along the way. Now, sun, shade and persistent wind, it's like gardening. Photographers are like plants, some are not keen on too much sun. We're shade hunters and wind can just be a little bit annoying. Too much sun, particularly at midday, produces very dark shadows and also what is known as blowout, um, which is a really highlighted bright area and you just lose the details of what you're photographing, particularly with plants. Reds become really obscure, so there are ways that we can just overcome this and um, there's some easy tools which you might already have in your garden shed that we can actually use to help um, diffuse the light. So ideally first thing in the morning is a really great time to photograph plants especially when perhaps the frost is thawing, dewdrops are still on the leaves and when plants are looking really fresh as a daisy they are just waking up after all. And a morning mist will add a wonderful sort of ethereal feel to a large open space. So if that's kind of not possible, first thing, often not, I'm really busy trying to get children out the door. Um, another time of day is the golden hour, so the evenings are getting lighter at last. So the golden hour is basically that time of the day um, in the early evening where the light is so beautifully diffused, providing that gorgeous, warm, golden and dappled tones. So... Um, I am going to address this wind issue. No, Michael, not that wind. But basically, I can't kind of try and avoid it if I can, especially doing close-up or stills. Some days are just not possible if I'm on a shoot. Um, 
as I will just end up with a blurry shot unless I want some sort of creative arty look. But when photographing flowers, I really need to kind of have them pretty sharp. So if I'm at home, I just tend to avoid um, the wind, if I can, um, leave it for another day or just when it's calmed down a bit. Composition is also important. You will already know about planting in odd numbers, leading lines and framing. It's the same with photography. Rule of three, just imagine three vertical and three horizontal lines on your phone screen or even better, you can actually download this grid um, from your camera setting. Grid lines are where to place your subject, either to the left or the right third of the frame. For example, if I'm photographing rows, I will place it on the intersection and the grid lines either to the left or the right. Using leading lines in your image will draw your viewer to what you want them to look at. You can either have them leading out or leading in. Then you've got framing, which is drawing your attention to the subject using the elements within the scene to create a nice comp composition. Do have a good look for distractions in the background of your image that you're capturing. I am always trying to dodge the wee bins in my garden, so generally try and keep them behind me. So with this all on board, do you feel ready to explore? Have a go at laying on the grass and turning your phone upside down and view things at plant level. I really love to do this. It's a great way to capture crocus and snowdrops, which are currently coming into bloom. Walk your phone through a clump of flowers and see what you can capture. If there's something in the way, like a twig or something, just take a different route. I use this same technique um, for photographing moss, lichen and small fungi. Uh, it's always a really good fun challenge. If it's not possible to get quite so low down, then a um, uh, flower pot with bulbs will do just pop it on the garden table and you can uh, still achieve this upside down phone wall for as I call it keeping things um, on an eye level plant eye level and just watching out for the background planting pots using the really good lasagna methods of layering bulbs will just provide months of uh, colourful display of blooms to photograph Phones these days are pretty good at blurring backgrounds and providing a quite a good twinkly light through um, trees. This blurry bit is called depth of field and the twinkly fairy light bit, as I call it, is bokeh, which comes from Japanese origins. This is the way the lens renders out of focus points of light. Experiment with portrait mode will help uh, with the depth of field and also remember to just place distance between uh, the nearest and furthermost elements. Just be careful on some smartphones that the depth of field doesn't go too blurry and you'll lose um, detail around the edge of the plant. Just move it backwards and forwards just to get it to the right um, place. Uh, also, get inspired. Have a flick through that gardening magazine whilst having a cuppa. Uh, look how plants have been photographed. Is there a particular style you're attracted to? I love the cinematography of a really good nature programme and I find it inspires me the most. So next time it's all about items lurking in the garden shed or around the house that can really help your photography instead of buying fancy equipment. Um, after all, we want to save those pennies for plants. Happy planting, happy snapping and thanks for listening. Serious Sticks of the Plant-Based Podcast was brought to you with the help of Vivara UK. Vivara are a team of garden wildlife experts and their mission is to make nature accessible to absolutely everyone. They provide plenty of ideas and solutions which can help you to create more wildlife habitats and that's in large green spaces or even small urban areas. Why not go and join them at vivara.co.uk? The music for the Plum Face podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James, and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Mm -hmm.